here we go. Uh, we have, oh yes, you guys have two mics to share. All right. Does everybody who wants to see it have a seat? Be generous to the people who've missed one, yes. Yes, yes. Uh, I should also say that the physical report you will get at the end as you leave. I'm not sure they have them yet, but uh, if you need to leave right now, you can ask in the, in the info when you go. So with me now are uh, Thomas Eskelson. Is it head of strategy? Is that your title now? Now it's head of strategy. Uh, I'm also the founder of Film Invest 27 years ago, and I worked as a CEO for 25 years. But now I work only with strategical questions, more or less. Head of strategy sounds like the most fun job to have in an organization like that, I should say. Film Invest is a, uh, the, an enormous regional funder, I should say, uh, here. Uh, Maria Tanela, you're a co-founder of Big, Cho Big Coach and Film Chair. Would you tell us, uh, Film Chain, sorry, would you tell us just very briefly what those are, or what Big, Big Coach is? So the, the two platforms are basically tech solutions <laughs> to enable the, the film industry stakeholders to interact better. Um, Big Couch started in 2014. Film Chain was established in 2017. For Film Chain, we're utilizing the blockchain technology to bring, um, to bring transparency in the financial flows. Um, so we basically, we recoup and allocate revenues on the blockchain technology. Um, and adding a layer to that, we're analyzing all the information um, in order to basically enable smarter decisions. So machine learning and, and, a, and AI. So kind of all those technologies that for some people can sound as buzzwords, uh, for other people can sound as the future, for some of the people can just sound as like, um, yeah, uh, quantum physics. But I mean, I should, I mean, obviously since you're here, we believe that you guys are right. So that's uh, already like a, a stamp of approval right here. Uh, then we have Glenn O'Farrell, your CEO of Group Media TFO, uh, which is um, uh, a public service um, educational provider in Ontario. And this means difficult from a Nordic perspective. So basically the size of Sweden, I think, <laughs> population-wise. So, so you're uh, uh, Ontario, we can think of it as the size of a country. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what uh, Group Media TFO is? So Globe Media TFO is a public agency that is devoted to a mission to produce, aggregate, and distribute educational content in the minority language of Ontario, because Canada has, of course, two official languages, French and English. But everywhere else except in the province of Quebec, French is a mo minority language. And in Ontario, the government decided some years ago to create an agency to support the public educational system by media through educational content that was developed for schoolrooms and learning environments. And what we did uh, over the past five years, seven years, is to transform what was a traditional uh, media organization, which one channel to market in the traditional sense of a te television channel, into a multimedia platform using our own uh, digital platforms and the platforms of third parties like YouTube. Uh, and basically, we produce our own we acquire from Canadian and non-Canadian sources, and we distribute. To give you an example, we never thought this was true, but there are francophone and francophile audiences throughout the world in places we never even assumed existed. Today, we operate 22 YouTube channels with 680 million views, and they're not all from Ontario. And I, I think one of the reasons that, that we were so pleased to interview in the report is that this is, so it's a little bit like Utbildingsradion if you're, if you're Swedish. Uh, and, and it doesn't seem like it should be very sexy or forward thinking. But in seven years, this whole organization has been entirely transformed. So, so I think Group Media TFO is especially uh, in the report as an example that it's totally possible to do things in a different way um, than you have been. So I, I said that, that my first question to each of you would be, what is your biggest future issue? What are you thinking about right now? Thomas, you're laughing, so you get to start. Yeah, I can start. <laughs> uh, I think it's, um, uh, since we are funding basically uh, feature films and TV drama, also some shorts and documentaries, more like talent programs, of course we are most occupied with what is happening in that sector. And... Uh, so I will say something about the challenge I think that we face in, in cinemas, but I also say something about production and capacity mm. not discussed in the report. Yes. Because uh, one of the biggest issues if you, not only in this country, but if you speak with people globally, is the lack of capacity. 
because we have had more or less uh, exponential growth in TV drama production. In Sweden, it's around 350% the last like four or five years. And that creates uh, a lack of enough skilled workforce, <laughs> but it's also a lack of talents because it's who should produce all this content that these platforms, more or less both domestic, uh, Nordic, but international platforms want to produce if they should really use local talents. And of course, that's also linked to some of the issues that is mentioned in the report about who can, who can work with the most interesting talent, who can attract the most interesting talent, and how much can we attract the most interesting talent, we, are, we that are working more or less predominantly I, in, the, in the Scandinavian context. But just to say, Film Invest has seven films in, in Berlin. We have a Norwegian, a Danish, a Colombian, a Brazilian, <laughs> and a Greek, and and also, so of course, so, some some other films. But I mean, it's 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 a global world, and we work globally. But still, we are most focusing on on the Nordic territories. So I think this thing about capacity is something that we will need to deal with really a lot the next like five years, at least the next five years. And this is also be, be because we had a meeting with very well known media mm. agency Olsberg SPI in the beginning of the festival. And they are dealing with this type of studies, inquiries globally, mm. because it's a global issue. It's not only something that happens here. How but should we be able to produce all this content? Yes, and a real question there, of course, is that part of this is that sort of we're also in a, probably in a kind of boom yeah. uh, time. So we don't want to build up a ton of infrastructure to provide capacity that isn't going to be needed after you know in year yeah. six to because ten. So there's some questions around that yeah. as well. Yeah, because we, I even if you are very, I think, uh, happily describing this mm. new context and everything that we can view and all the technological changes. There is only 25 hours that yeah. we can use. Even if we optimize the commute. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Maria? What do you, what do you think is the biggest, uh, what is your biggest future question? Well, uh, frankly, it's, it's a continuation of, of what um, uh, Thomas said. Um, when when you asked us this question to think about, um, it's it was so hard to pick. I was just thinking, I was like, oh my goodness, um, there there are so many topics that you can think of, and I I went back to speak to a friend of mine who is just an avid cinema lover, so I was just like, okay, let m let's brainstorm this because you are audience and and what 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 is your pain? Because I, I I realize that sometimes we kind of forget to ask that mm. um and he was like well i'm just really overwhelmed he said i think there's so much content out there it's a it's a mix of fear of missing out i i know i only have like two three hours per evening to and i have to choose one film there's so many platforms out there there's so much content and i don't know what to pick and um, if I watch something that it, it's it's kind of you know so and so, uh, then uh, then it, that really frustrates me. So I was like, right, yeah. So there's there's a, a boom of content. There's so many platforms, subscription, and 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 not only. And you hear about all these films, and and you you see snippets here and there. But I think there's still um, a huge issue of curation and understanding audiences. So my question would be, what can we do in order to help audiences find their content? Because people people n know what they like, you know, they, they, they have interests, they have passions, they, they connect with with um, with uh, several pieces of content more than more than others. Some are just pure, you know, lovers of, of art house films and that's why Mubi is doing such a brilliant job. I, I've been with them since the beginning, since they weren't even doing curation. I was one of their subscribers. But afterwards, it's just like, I know that whatever I watch on their platform, I, we will 
we will be on the same wavelength. The, mm -hmm. I, I, I know what, what they, they cater. Um, they cater f for me, basically. Um, or let's say in, in the UK, Curzon already kind of created a, a context, Curzon Cinema. It's like the go-to place for art, art house cinema. And I know that if I go to Curzon, 90% of the time uh, they they will they were cater for my needs mm. so creating either community based events or having impact producers a complete restructuring marketing and the way and the way films find their um their audience and how audiences f find their their content I think that's where we need to do a better job. I really like that you're also saying that you're mentioning, you know, impact producers and, and all that it isn't because I think sometimes because historically, of course, we used to make a, a piece and then put it into the tube and then eventually it would come out and some other people would connect it with an audience. But but now I think everybody in the chain needs to think about how to answer these questions and how to create these changes. And still it's the big lack of data. So yeah. there's no data um, and that's what, that, that's what um, we kind of... Uh, we kind of drifted into from from the blockchain is like blockchain collects data and then what do you do with the data so mm. or, or collects in a kind of very transparent and and uh, well structured manner but it's just like what what do people want to see mm -hmm. um, does anyone know um, yeah. or, or or they just as I said it in the report they <laughs> they um, they just kind of stab in the dark and based on gut feeling Glenn what is your big future future question um, don't worry well, I think that the, the title of your report and the way you presented it, it really does nail it for me personally, and I think for most of the people in uh, my organization, and that's about relevance. I think that we are in a, uh, we're living in a time, in a time of remarkable change, incredible disruption, waves upon waves of accelerating new technologies that are upsetting the things that we thought were settled yesterday. They're not. <laughs> They're unsettled today. And being and having a relevant voice in that environment, in that ecosystem, is my principal preoccupation. Uh, and it's what I try to bring to my job from a strategic perspective. So I told you a little bit about what we do. Um, what we try to do f fundamentally as a, as a team, and we live in Toronto. So Toronto is 4.5 million people, very, very diverse. We have 44 people, 44 nationalities represented in a 225 person workforce. So very, very diverse. We try to draw on our people extensively. Mm -hmm. And we have tried, and I'm not saying we've been successful 100%. We keep trying, though, <laughs> and we'll keep trying. We try to bring three things forward. Number one is to inspire people to go to the limit of their creative imagination. Mm -hmm. And Tomas, I think that there's a lot of potential there. In, even where we see limited resources, I think if we give people license to think creatively and to push their boundaries of imagination in all forms of employment, we will be surprised with the outcomes. Number two is, and you said it in your report, is to try to not just live the technology, but to acquire a sense of ourselves in the technology and see it all as part of a movement. And it's accelerating and it's keeping uh, on accelerating and it's not gonna be slower next year, it's gonna be faster. And the third thing is data. Uh, yes, I do believe everything can be measured, and we have to use that to our benefit in everything we do. We say, nous voulons être une entreprise pilotée par la donnée. So we really want to be in all forces and all parts of our, of our workforce using data as much as possible. So I threw out the challenge 18 months ago to my management team. I said, I'm not going to tell you how to do this. Figure it out for yourselves. But over the course of the next two to three years, you have to see yourself in some way as a data scientist. So when we say data, I, I think that's one of those, there are this, there's this terminology conflict between the different industries. I think a lot of people who come from the humanities or who come from the arts, when we say data, they become like, oh, that sounds very abstract. But when we say data, what we mean is things like audience reception or or, or, or very specific things. It can be when do people stop watching a thing, or when, what, when do people start crying when they watch something. It can, be, it can be very emotional. All of this is data. Any kind of information about the release, uh, about the reception. The impact. The impact. All of this is data. And, and I think that we need to somehow, d one part, one step on the way could be if we could just find better language to translate these concepts that seem so alien into tools that, that we can use. Yeah. yeah, but but I think uh, if we look at your first 
issue, the, the thing about public funding. And it's true that public selective funding mm. is decreasing, but public automatic funding is not decreasing. It's the opposite. It's increasing. More and more countries, more and more territories have some form of tax incentive, production incentive, whatsoever. And the thing with those type of systems are, of course, that they can present data because they should only present economical data, mm. the economical outcome of that. And they don't need to care about if it's an interesting film audience-wise or for 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 uh, for the for the art house market, whatever. They don't need to care. And the problem for public funding is today that public funding only have extremely old tools to measure uh, success. Mm. And we can only access also if we look at actually viewers or who watch things. We can only access what's accessible. And that's more or less that we can access cinema figures and we can access what happens at least in the free TV window. We have no access at all what happens in the rest in all of these VOD platforms, whatever. Which is impossible, I mean, yes. especially now when we yeah. have to think about the work and the lifetime yeah. of the work yeah. and marketing has to change and that has to happen in all the windows. And, and that means that we lack an argument mm. because we need that argument to be able to both secure but also to increase public funding. So how do, we pr how do we solve this? How do we, how do we create those better metrics that, that we would all love to see? What are the first steps? stab at it and I'll let Maria, because she's a blockchain expert. We also did a blockchain project. Mm. We developed a prototype for the Canadian audiovisual sector, trying to imagine how blockchain would envelop the beginning of a creative work, a film, from concept to use, using all uh, elements of that f phase, and we simulated it and we've market tested it. And frankly, we discovered along the way that while there were many interested parties who would have access to new information that would bring data to the decisions that they make that would perhaps give them more clarity or at least more options, informed options. They can choose whichever way they want. The funders were the principal beneficiaries <laughs> because it gave them new metrics and a brand new, absolutely real-time ab ability, crafted, cut up, diced, whichever way you wanted to see what that product is doing and what market how and what it's not doing. Whereas all of the funding decisions, all of those that are uh, selective or the more general in the way of tax credits and, and, and those, which you're right, Tomas, are, I think, growing in many instances because people want to bring employment to their jurisdictions and providing tax credit is a way of doing that. Um, I think it gives people an opportunity to see what their decisions are doing now as opposed to what they did last year because of the way reporting used to work. This gives you real-time data to start affecting change now. So I think... One of the things that we could do is use examples like blockchain to bring about more visibility, more uh, data, and more ability to inform the various parties around the table, including the funders, as to what their, their, their um, pro the products that they are supporting are, are achieving. So some people will immediately say, well, but the big companies, they're not going to have any transparency, and, 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 you know, and everybody's going to see it on their proprietary data. Does it make a difference that we have some data, that, like the, the little data that we can have, or the data for the projects where we can get it, does it make a difference? So, yes, definitely. My, my point on that was you, you might have the tools, you might create the tools, but if you don't bring all the stakeholders to the table and you make them all play nicely or you incentivize them for like pure market design, you know, like economics theories of, of how you incentivize everyone, how you give them something, how they're winning something out of it, they will not use the tools and, you, and, 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 and this consensus will not happen. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can, you can build the best apps, you can build the best tools, but but more than anything, I think it's everyone's everyone's role to 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 bring the whole industry together and to start communicating. Just bring all the stakeholders to the table. And uh, the the issue is being so fragmented. And uh, uh, let's say um, that you are starting to, in our case, you know, to collect revenue data. We have access to that because simply we we gather the revenues and and then we see how the, let's say, the film is performing. 
but you can't stop there. Um, obviously, our, our, our kind of uh, our biggest allies are, are the are the the, the funding bodies. Uh, the producers and the financiers they need to see the money back and they need to understand what's happening with the product. Mm. But if you don't have all the other all the other members of the team coming and opening up um, about about number of views, about marketing techniques, about oh, you know what trailer worked, how they got that impact, uh, how they sold to that territory. Um, it's it's. It's it's basically it, it just remains a tool. So one thing that is important to remember: yes, you guys are doing it with the blockchain, but it's also possible to just do it in a room. You can literally have a meeting where everybody in the value chain who has who has been working on the same film is sitting down and and opening up a little bit about their numbers. Correct. Uh, to so at least at the end of a project, so that you can learn what worked and what didn't work. This is something that it's possible to do. Then this is one of those things that we can practically all start doing. Uh, and I think that that's a win-win all the way through. But filmmaking is very complicated. It's, it's astonishing to me that we can make something as incredibly complex as a feature film, and we all collaborate in this magical dance to produce these incredibly complex products, and then we spend the rest of our time bickering beneath it, between each other in these silos uh, and, and behaving like we're enemies. I, do you guys realistically believe that we, the industry, all the different parts of the industry, can get together and can collaborate on solving these problems? Because I, I think it's time. <laughs> Thomas? Yes, I, and I also think it's extremely crucial that because I think particularly if you want to defend in, on a long-term basis, support to what we sometimes call difficult film, but art house movies that today has very low cinema attendance in general, if we speak about the Swedish market. Uh, uh, and it doesn't matter if it's a Swedish or if it's a non-Swedish art house mm -hmm. movie, still it's substantially lower than it was like five, six years ago. Um, then if, you, if we really want to support that, I, I do think that we need to change, of course, we have said that so many times, the distribution models, the, the way of, of making this uh, available for, for uh, an audience, but we also need the figures. Because without the figures, because I'm a political scientist <laughs> from, the, from the beginning, so I'm not from the film field, so, and I worked extremely a lot with politicians. Uh, as you often do as a public funder, because you need to, s to find the, the money that you should use to give away to others, so to speak. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very hard, and it's harder and harder if you don't have relevant data. And you cannot say that it was fantastic, it was 2,500 admissions in the cinemas. That doesn't work today. Even if those 2,500 persons had the most fantastic fantastic experience when they watch that movie. And then you tell, okay, but then it will be screened on free TV. Yeah, 70,000 watch that mm -hmm. movie because it's a very typical thing in Sweden. But, uh, but that's not enough. Not enough if you should support that type of work with something like 1.5 million, if it's not a high budget thing, 1.5 million euro mm -hmm. taxpayers money. Then you need to know something a little bit more about what happened with that. And I mm -hmm. think this is really crucial because I totally agree with the, this picture about what is happening in the pol on, the p in, on the political arena and the type of forces that are working there. So I think this is so key I think thing. I, an important thing is here to say, the, the whole point with, with supporting experimentation and, and, and art house film is that you're, you also have to be allowed to fail. That, ha that has to be part of the process, or in any kind of innovation process, indeed. You have to be allowed to fail. So this isn't about always succeeding, but when you fail, you need to understand why. What happened? And that's what makes that investment the fa of the inv failure worth the money. If you just fail and it didn't work out and nobody knows why, then it was a waste of taxpayers' money. It's not the project that is it, it's the lack of the answers that is it. Uh, Maria, you're nodding. Yeah, that's the or, logic, but not the political yeah. No, well, no. But then, then we need to explain that better. Maria, what are you thinking? 
I was thinking, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm generally quite a, a, an optimistic person, so I definitely see more and more people um, and more and more filmmakers that are super driven to understand uh, understand uh, how things are, are happening with their project and, uh, and, and, and people who no longer want to just kind of count on their fee. You know, you have your fee in your budget or you have your public funding or your s mm, subsidy, if even if you're a distribution and so on, and you, you just get your figure and then you do kind of half of your job and you you kind of let it in the world and 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 forget about the film uh, and bury it and move on to the next one i think that's no longer possible mm -hmm. and 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 new filmmakers new producers um uh, actually from from all of all um all of the members of the value chain understand the, the need to make this 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 industry sustainable so uh that means more collaboration, better initiatives, better use of tools, and um, and 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 yeah, just uh, good enough is 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 something of, of the past. They they want to they want to have an impact. You're uh, hitting on something that I think some people who read the report will be very upset about. Stan Salovaris uh, talks about something he calls industry sustenance movies, and you're kind of also describing this: films that get made because people need to work. And it becomes good enough, and it disappears somewhere, and then we never know or hear about them again. And the people who made them perhaps never want to think about them uh, again either. But I mean, if your if your if your rent, if your children's food is depending on industry sustenance movies, it's a terrible thing to know that these are going to disappear. But I think these are going to have to to disappear. Now we're running out of, of time. Uh, unfortunately, almost said running out of money. It's because I'm in the film industry. <laughs> we're <laughs> almost running out of time. So I think that I would like uh, for each of you to s to just say what like to suggest the first step. If you've now heard this presentation or you're reading the re report and and you realize that a lot of big things are happening and changes are coming whether we want it or not and it's slightly terrifying and slightly inspiring. Where do I begin in my organization? And remember that I can be anywhere in the, in the value chain of, of uh, audiovisual production. Uh, Glenn, would you like to begin? What would be your, your first piece of practical advice? Well, I'd go back to, first of all, your comment a few minutes ago, and that is, if you don't understand why you failed, the failure is useless to you. I speak from personal experience. I'm a failed singer-songwriter. I gave that up <laughs> to become a lawyer, and now I'm in media. I'm not saying I'm necessarily good as a lawyer or in media, but I know I'm better than I was in singer-songwriting because that was not very good. But I think you have to look at that and say, I really have to learn from these failures and not to be afraid of it. Number two is, I think we have to understand that we live in an attention economy. The numbers that you were showing on your chart above, in terms of market cap, take the top five, top ten in the world, and convince yourselves that they are not in the business of attention economy, and uh, I think that you are in denial because they all are directly involved in a big part of their business, which is segregated across many sectors of activity. But they are fundamentally playing in, an, in, in what we can call the attention economy. Number three is each organization, I think, has to understand that the changes that we understood today are not going to be there necessarily tomorrow. And I think that we have to make our organizations very responsive and resilient to keep learning. I said this to Joanna when we were talking about Toffler's book, 1970, Future Shock, about the illiterates of the 21st century, not being those who couldn't read and write, but those who couldn't learn to unlearn to relearn. And that sounds trite. I know that. It sounds like, oh, what the hell does that mean? Well, it means that we really have to kind of go into ourselves and say, what I learned today isn't necessarily what I'm going to use tomorrow. I may use it in part, but I may have to relearn it all over again because things have shifted around me. I personally think that that's extraordinary, that's exhilarating, that's stimulating. Mm -hmm. It gives you a chance to open your horizons and learn new things and learn new things about new people. At the same time, it is challenging, but everybody is in this, mi is in this mix. There is no sector of the economy, there is no sector of civil or social life that is not profoundly living, unheard of, and unprecedented disruption like the kind we are living now. It's historic. Mm -hmm. And I finished with one last point. Populism is on the rise. There's no doubt about that because it's an easy solution to all this disruption. It's easy to revert back and to hide yourself in a, in a shadow and say, I'm okay here because I'm, no, I'm out of the light, I'm not gonna get hit or I won't be as, as vulnerable. I think the more you, you, you recede into the darkness, the more vulnerable you are. Yeah. You have to go out and play right where it's happening, right in the middle of the street. Maria, what's your uh, practical advice? Thank you. My practical advice would be around, um, around the tech giants. 
I would say people should not be overwhelmed by the thought that the tech giants have entered the space and they're taking over. I don't think that's happening. Um, I think the most important is to be resilient, to find your network of people, build your community, build a brand and a culture around whatever you do, and 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 you'll be fine. I, I don't believe in um, monopolies or ol oligopolies. I think they can be massively disrupted by the power of 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 yeah of communities and networks that are counterbalancing um very economically driven <laughs> uh content uh, content production so that would be it thank you uh, i think the role of uh, for public funders public financiers of particularly of feature film will be need to be distinctly different uh, from what it's been before. Because I think uh, the role of the funder is not only to fund. The role of the funder is also to bring discussion, to bring knowledge, to bring competence, to bring networks, and also to be actually involved in the projects you choose to finance from A to Z. Mm. And to really also discuss projects more like in a 360 degree type of analysis than only to speak about the script or what is this dir director, blah, blah, blah. And this is also very important because I think it's not only the producer and the director and the filmmaker that should involve themselves much more in what will happen with the film when it meets the audience. It's also the funder. So your tip is we need holistic funding agencies. I like that. <laughs> so I guess the, the, my final uh, piece of advice is that I, I said many times in the presentation that, that they're in the business of making relationships, but so are we. I think that's perhaps the most important takeaway. If you make something that is connecting with an audience, what you're making, uh, well, you are also in the business of making relationships. And if we can just manage that one mind shift, I think uh, that already is going to help align many of these pieces of incredibly good advice and incredibly practical advice that you all gave us. Thank you so much, Glenn O'Farrell, Maria Tanjala, and uh, Thomas Eskilsson. And when you all leave, you will receive your report on the way out. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> <laughs>